Hello and welcome to another in a series of lectures on United States history. This will be lecture number 11, so let's get into it. This is going to cover the 1960s. Complacent and comfortable as the 1950s closed, Americans elected in 1960 a young, vigorous president who pledged to get the country moving again. Neither the, <clears throat> neither the nation nor the new president had any inkling, as the new decade opened, just how action-packed it would be, both at home and abroad. By the end of the stormy 60s, many Americans would yearn nostalgically for the comparative calm of the 50s. Hatless and topcoatless, in the 22-degree weather, John F. Kennedy delivered a stirring inaugural address on January the 20th, 1961. The youngest president ever elected, he assembled one of the youngest cabinets, including his 35-year-old brother Robert as Attorney General. Bobby, the president quipped, would find the experience useful when he began to practice law. The new Attorney General set out, among other reforms, to change the priorities of the FBI. The Bureau deployed nearly a thousand agents on internal security work, but targeted only a dozen against organized crime and gave virtually no attention to civil rights violations. Kennedy's efforts were stoutly resisted by J. Edgar Hoover, who had served as FBI director longer than Kennedy had been alive. Business whiz Robert S. McNamara left the presidency of the Ford Motor Company to take over the Defense Department. Along with other youthful, talented advisors, they made up an inner circle of what was known as the best and brightest men. From the outset, Kennedy inspired high expectations especially among the young. His challenge of a new frontier quickened patriotic pulses. He brought a warm heart to the Cold War when he proposed the Peace Corps, an army of idealistic and mostly youthful volunteers to bring American skills to underdeveloped countries. He summoned citizens to service with his clarion call to, quote, ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country." Unquote. Now, it's also at this point that I would sometimes show a video on this particular speech, but again, we don't have the access in this particular format to do that. Kennedy, a Harvard-educated Ivy League individual, will have his own Ivy League lieutenants, also heavily from Harvard, exuding confidence in their abilities. The president's personal grace and wit won him the deep affection of many of his fellow citizens. In an unprecedented gesture, he invited white-maned poet Robert Frost to speak at his inaugural ceremonies. The old Vermont poet shrewdly took stock of the situation and said, you are something of Irish, and I suppose something of Harvard. He told Kennedy and advised him to be more Irish than Harvard. Kennedy came into office with a narrow Democratic majority in Congress. Southern members of his own party threatened to team up with Republicans and lay the axe to the new frontier proposals such as medical assistance for the aged and increased federal aid to education. Kennedy won a first round in his campaign for a more cooperative Congress when he forced an expansion of the all-important House Rules Committee dominated by conservatives who could have bottled up his entire legislative program. Despite this victory, the new frontier did not expand swiftly. 
key medical de uh, and educational bills remained stalled in Congress. Another vexing problem was the economy. Kennedy had campaigned on the theme of revitalizing the economy after the recessions of the later Eisenhower years. While his advisors debated the best kind of economic medicine to apply, the president tried to hold the line against crippling inflation. His administration helped negotiate a non-inflationary wage agreement in the steel industry in early 1962. The assumption was that the companies, for their part, would keep the lid on prices. Almost immediately, steel management announced significant price increases, thereby seemingly demonstrating bad faith. The president erupted in wrath, remarking that his father had once said that all businessmen were sons of beep. He called the steelmen into the White House and lashed them with his temper. Overawed, the steel uh, operators backed down, displaying SOB buttons, which meant sons of business or save our business. The steel episode provoked fiery attacks by big business on the new frontier. But Kennedy soon appealed to believers in free enterprise when he announced his support of a general tax cut bill. He rejected the advice of those who wished greater government spending and chose to stimulate the economy by slashing taxes and putting more money directly into private hands. When he announced his policy before a big business group, one observer called it the most Republican speech since McKinley. For economic stimulus, as well as for military strategy and scientific prestige, Kennedy also promoted a multi-billion dollar project to land an American on the moon. When skeptics objected that the money could best be spent elsewhere, Kennedy answered them in a speech at Rice University in Texas. But why, some say, the moon? And they may well ask, why climb the highest mountain? Why, 35 years ago, fly the Atlantic? Why does Rice play Texas? $24 billion later in 1969, two American astronauts triumphantly planted human footprints on the moon's dusty surface. A few months after settling into the White House, the new president met Soviet Premier Khrushchev at Vienna in June of 1961. Kennedy sought cooperation, but the tough-talking Russian adopted a belligerent attitude, threatening to make a treaty with East Germany and cut off Western access to Berlin. Visibly shaken, the president refused to be bullied. Upon returning, he requested an increase in the military budget and called up reserve troops for the possible defense of Berlin. The Soviets backed off from their most bellicose threats but suddenly began to construct the Berlin Wall in August 1961. The barbed wire and concrete barrier was designed to plug the heavy population drain from East Germany to West Germany. But to the free world, the wall of shame looked like a gigantic enclosure around a concentration camp. The wall stood for almost three decades as an ugly scar symbolizing the post World War II division of Europe into two hostile camps. Kennedy, meanwhile, turned his attention to Western Europe, now miraculously prospering after the tonic of the Marshall Plan and the growth of the American-encouraged common market, the Commercial Union, later renamed the European Community. He finally secured passage of the Trade Expansion Act in 1962, authorizing tariff cuts of up to 50% to promote trade with common market countries. This legislation led to the so-called Kennedy Round of Tariff Negotiations, concluded in 1967, and to a significant expansion of European-American trade. 
but not all of Kennedy's ambitious designs for Europe were realized. American policymakers were dedicated to an economically and militarily united Atlantic community, with the United States as the dominant partner. But they found their way blocked by towering, stiff-backed Charles de Gaulle of France. The Frenchman was suspicious of American intentions in Europe and on fire to recapture the glory of Napoleonic France. With a haughty no, he vetoed British application for common market membership in 1963, fearing that Britain would serve as a Trojan horse for deepening American control over European affairs. He likewise dashed cold water on an American proposal to develop a multinational nuclear arm within NATO. De Gaulle deemed the Americans unreliable in a crisis, so he tried to preserve French freedom of action by developing his own small atomic force. Despite the perils of nuclear proliferation or Soviet domination, de Gaulle demanded an independent Europe free of Yankee influence. Special problems for American foreign policy emerged from the worldwide decolonization of European overseas possessions at the end of World War II. The African Congo received its independence from Belgium in 1960 and immediately exploded into violence. The United Nations sent in a peacekeeping force to which Washington contributed much money but no manpower. The United States was picking up the tab for United Nations operations while the organization itself was becoming dominated by the newer, numerous nations from once colonial Asia and Africa, who were often critical of American foreign policy. Sparsely populated Laos, freed of its French colonial overlords in 1954, was festering dangerously by the time Kennedy came into office. The Eisenhower administration had drenched this jungle kingdom with dollars, but failed to cleanse the country of an aggressive communist element. A red Laos, many observers feared, would be a river on which the influence of communist China would flood into all of Southeast Asia. As the Laotian civil war raged, Kennedy's military advisers seriously considered sending in American troops but the president found that he had insufficient forces to put out the fire in Asia and still honor his commitments in Europe. Kennedy thus sought a diplomatic escape hatch in the 14-power Geneva Conference, which agreed on the neutralization of Laos in 1962. These bushfire wars intensified the pressure for a shift away from Secretary Dulles's dubious doctrine of massive retaliation. Kennedy felt hamstrung by the knowledge that in a crisis he had the devil's choice between humiliation or nuclear incineration. With Defense Secretary McNamara, he pushed the strategy of flexible response, that is, developing an array of military options that could be precisely matched to the scope and importance of the crisis at hand. To this end, Kennedy increased spending on conventional military forces and bolstered the special forces. They were an elite anti-guerrilla outfit trained to survive on snake meat and to kill with scientific finesse. The doctrine of flexible response seemed sane enough, but it contained lethal logic. It potentially lowered the level at which diplomacy would give way to shooting. It also provided a mechanism for a progressive and possibly endless stepping up of the use of force. Vietnam soon presented a grisly demonstration of these dangers. The right-wing Diem government in Saigon, despite a deluge of American dollars, had ruled shakily since the partition of Vietnam in 1954. Anti-Diem agitation spearheaded by the local communist Viet Cong and encouraged by the Red Regime in the North, noisily threatened to topple the pro-American government from power. In a fateful decision late in 1961, 
Kennedy ordered a sharp increase in the number of military advisors, or U.S. troops, into South Vietnam. American forces had allegedly entered Vietnam to foster political stability, to help protect Diem from the communists long enough to allow him to enact basic social reforms favored by the Americans. But the Kennedy administration eventually despaired of the reactionary Diem and encouraged a successful coup against him in November 1963. Ironically, the United States thus contributed to a long process of political disintegration that its original policy had meant to prevent. Kennedy still told the South Vietnamese that it was their war, but he had made dangerously deep political commitments. By the time of his death, he had ordered more than 15,000 American men into the far-off Asian slaughterhouse. A graceful pullout was becoming increasingly difficult. Although the United States regarded Latin America as its backyard, its southern neighbors feared and resented the powerful colossus of the North. Kennedy extended the hand of friendship with the Alliance for Progress, hailed as a Marshall Plan for Latin America. A primary goal was to help the good neighbors close the gap between the rich and the poor and thus quiet communist agitation. But results were disappointing. There was little alliance, and even less progress. American handouts had little positive impact on Latin America's social problems. President Kennedy also struck below the border with a mailed fist. He had inherited from the Eisenhower administration a CIA-backed scheme to topple Fidel Castro from power, by invading Cuba with anti-communist exiles. Trained and armed by Americans and supported by American air power, the invaders would trigger a popular uprising in Cuba and sweep to victory. Or at least that was the plan. On a fateful April 17, 1961 day, some 1,200 exiles landed at Cuba's Bay of Pigs. Kennedy had decided from the outset against direct intervention, and the ancient aircraft of the anti-Castroites were no match for Castro's air force. In addition, no popular uprising greeted the invaders. With the invasion bogged down at the Bay of Pigs, Kennedy stood fast in his decision to keep hands off, and the bullet-riddled band of anti-Castroites surrendered. Most of the invaders rotted for two years in Cuba's jails, but were eventually ransomed for some $62 million worth of American drugs and other supplies. President Kennedy assumed full responsibility for the failure, remarking that victory has a hundred fathers and defeat is an orphan. The Bay of Pigs blunder, along with continuing American covert efforts to assassinate Castro and overthrow his government, naturally pushed the Cuban leader even further into the Soviet embrace. Wiley Chairman Khrushchev lost little time taking full advantage of his Cuban comrade's position, just 90 miles off of Flores' coast. In October of 1962, the aerial photographs of American spy planes revealed the Russians were secretly and speedily installing nuclear-tipped missiles in Cuba. The Soviets evidently intended to use these devastating weapons to shield Castro and to blackmail the United States into backing down in Berlin and other troubled spots. Kennedy and Khrushchev now began a nerve-wracking game of nuclear chicken. The president flatly rejected Air Force uh, proposals for a surgical bombing strike against the missile launching sites. Instead, on October the 22nd, 1962, he ordered a naval quarantine of Cuba and demanded immediate removal of the threatening missiles. He also served notice on Khrushchev that any attack on the United States from Cuba would be regarded as coming from the Soviet Union and would trigger nuclear retaliation against the Russian heartland. For an anxious week, 
Americans waited while Soviet ships approached the patrol line established by the United States Navy off the island of Cuba. Sinking a Russian vessel on the high seas would unquestionably be regarded by the Kremlin as an act of war. And so the world teetered breathlessly on the brink of global war. In this tense eyeball-to-eyeball -eyeball confrontation, Khrushchev finally flinched. On October the 28th, he agreed to a partially face-saving compromise by which he would pull the missiles out of Cuba. The United States, in return, agreed to end the quarantine and not invade the island. The American government also quietly signaled that it would remove from Turkey some of its own missiles targeted on the Soviet Union. Fallout from the Cuban Missile Crisis was considerable. A humiliated Khrushchev was ultimately hounded out of the Kremlin and became an unperson. Hardliners in Moscow, vowing never again to be humiliated in a nuclear face-off, launched an enormous program of military expansion. The Soviet build-up reached a crescendo in the next decade, stimulating in turn a vast American effort to catch up with the Russians. The Democrats did better than expected in the midterm elections of 1962, allegedly because the Republicans were Cubanized. Kennedy apparently sobered by the appalling risks he had just run, pushed harder for a nuclear test ban treaty with the Soviet Union. After prolonged negotiations with Moscow, a pact prohibiting trial nuclear explosions in the atmosphere was signed in late 1963. Another barometer indicating a thaw in the Cold War was the installation of a Moscow-Washington hotline, permitting immediate teletype communication in case of crisis. Most significant was Kennedy's speech at American University, Washington, D.C., in June 1963. The president urged Americans to abandon a view of Russia as a devil-ridden land filled with fanatics, and instead to deal with the world as it was, not as it might have been had the history of the last 18 years been different. Kennedy thus tried to lay the foundations for a realistic policy of peaceful coexistence with the Soviet Union. Here were the modest origins of the policy that would later come to be known as détente. Kennedy had campaigned with a strong appeal to black voters, but he proceeded gingerly to redeem his promises. Although he had pledged to eliminate racial discrimination in housing, with a stroke of the pen. It took him nearly two years to find the right pen. Civil rights groups, meanwhile, sent thousands of pens to the White House in a Ink for Jack protest against the President's slowness. Political concerns stayed the President's hand on civil rights. Elected by a wafer-thin margin and with shaky control over the Congress, Kennedy needed the support of Southern legislators to pass his economic and social legislation, especially his medical and educational bills. He believed, perhaps justifiably, that those measures would eventually benefit black Americans at least as much as specific legislation on civil rights. Bold moves for racial justice would have to wait. But events soon scrambled these careful calculations. Following the wave of sit-ins that surged across the South in 1960, groups of freedom riders fanned out to end segregation in facilities serving interstate bus passengers. A white mob torched a freedom ride bus near Anniston, Alabama in May 1961, and Attorney General Robert Kennedy's personal representative was beaten unconscious in another anti-freedom ride riot in Montgomery. When Southern officials proved unwilling or unable to stem the violence, Washington dispatched federal marshals to protect the Freedom Riders. Reluctantly but fatefully, 
the Kennedy administration had now joined hands with the civil rights movement. Because of that partnership, the Kennedys proved ultra wary about Martin Luther King Jr.'s political associates. Fearful of embrace of embarrassing revelations that some of King's advisors had communist affiliations. Robert Kennedy ordered the FBI to put wiretaps on King's phone in late 1963. But for the most part, the relationship between King and the Kennedys was a fruitful one. Encouraged by Robert Kennedy and with financial backing from Kennedy prodded private foundations. Uh, Civil rights groups inaugurated a voter education project to register the South's historically disenfranchised blacks. Because of his support for civil rights, President Kennedy told a group of black leaders in 1963, I may lose the next election, but I don't care. Integrating Southern universities threatened to provoke wholesale slaughter. Some desegregated painlessly but the University of Mississippi became a volcano. A 1929, I'm sorry, a 29-year-old Air Force veteran, James Meredith, encountered violent opposition when he attempted to register in October of 1962. In the end, President Kennedy was forced to send in 400 federal marshals and 3,000 troops to enroll Meredith in his first class. He ultimately graduated with a sheepskin that cost the lives of two men, scores of injuries, and some four million taxpayer dollars. In the spring of 1963, Martin Luther King Jr. launched a campaign against discrimination in Birmingham, Alabama, the most segregated big city in America. Though they constituted nearly half the city's population, blacks made up fewer than 15% of the city's voters. Previous attempts to crack the city's rigid racial barriers had produced more than 50 cross burnings and 18 bomb attacks since 1957. Some of the people sitting here will not come back alive from his campaign, King advised his organizers. Events soon confirmed this grim prediction of violence. Watching developments on television screens, a horrified world saw peaceful civil rights marchers repeatedly repelled by police with attack dogs and electric cattle prods. Most fearsome were the high-pressure water hoses directed at the demonstrators. Special monitor guns delivered water with enough force to knock bricks loose from buildings or strip bark from trees at a distance of a hundred feet. The hoses bowled little children down the street like tumbleweeds. Jolted by these confrontations, President Kennedy delivered a memorable televised speech to the nation on June the 11th, 1963. In contrast to Eisenhower's cool aloofness from the racial question, Kennedy called the situation a moral issue and committed his personal and presidential prestige to finding a solution. Drawing on the same spiritual traditions as Martin Luther King, Jr., Kennedy declared that the principle at stake was as old as the scriptures and as clear as the American Constitution. He called for new civil rights legislation to protect black citizens. In August, Martin Luther King, Jr. led 200,000 black and white demonstrators on a peaceful march on Washington to support the proposed legislation. Still, the violence continued. On the very night of Kennedy's stirring television address, a white gunman shot down Medgar Evers, a black Mississippi civil rights worker. In September 1963, an explosion blasted a Baptist church in Birmingham, killing four black girls who had just finished their lesson called The Love That Forgives. By the time of Kennedy's death, his civil rights bill was making little headway, and frustrated blacks were growing increasingly impatient. Violence haunted America in the mid-1960s, and it stalked grotesquely onto center stage on November the 22nd, 
1963. While riding in an open limousine in downtown Dallas, Texas, President Kennedy was shot in the head by a concealed gunman and died within seconds. As a sunned nation nursed its grief, the tragedy grew still more unbelievable. The alleged assassin, a figure named Lee Harvey Oswald, was himself shot to death in front of the television cameras by a self-appointed Avenger named Jack Ruby. So bizarre were the events surrounding the two murders that even an elaborate official investigation conducted by Chief Justice Warren could not quiet all doubts and theories about what had really happened. Vice President Johnson was promptly sworn in as president on a waiting plane and flown back to Washington with Kennedy's body. Though he mistrusted many in Kennedy's cabinet, Johnson will retain most of them. The new, pre the new president managed a dignified and efficient transition, pledging contin uh, continuity with his predecessor's policies. For several days, the nation was steeped in sorrow. Not until then did many Americans realize how fully their young, vibrant president and his captivating wife had cast a spell over them. Chopped down in his prime after only slightly more than a thousand days in the White House, he was acclaimed more for the ideals he had enunciated and the spirit he had kindled than for the concrete goals he had achieved. He had laid one myth to rest forever, that a Catholic could not be trusted with the presidency of the United States. Mass was celebrated only once in the White House, the day of his funeral. The torch had now passed to Lyndon Baines Johnson, a Texan who towered at six foot three. The new president hailed from the area of West Texas, whose people had sent him to Washington as a 29-year-old congressman in 1937. Franklin Roosevelt was a political daddy to him, Johnson claimed, and he had supported New Deal measures down the line. But when LBJ lost a Senate race in 1941, he learned the sobering lesson that liberal political beliefs did not necessarily win elections. He trimmed his sails to the right and squeezed himself into a Senate seat in 1948 with a questionable 87-vote margin, hence the ironic nickname that he was given Landslide Linden. Entrenched in the Senate, Johnson developed into a legislative wheeler-dealer. He became the Democratic majority leader in 1954, wielding power second only to that of Eisenhower in the White House. He could move mountains or checkmate opponents as the occasion demanded, using what came to be known as the Johnson treatment, a flashing display of backslapping, flesh-pressing, and arm-twisting, that overbore friend and foe alike. As president, Johnson quickly shed the conservative coloration of his Senate years to reveal a still-living liberal underneath. Johnson declared to Congress that they could do more than give verbal praise to President Kennedy's memory. They could also fight for his civil rights bill. And with that backing, they will. He will also push through Kennedy's stalled tax cuts and civil rights bills through Congress, and added proposals of his own for a billion-dollar war on poverty. Johnson voiced special concern for Appalachia, or Appalachia, however you want to pronounce it. 
where the sickness of the soft coal industry had left tens of thousands of mountain folk on a human slag heap. Johnson's nomination by the Democrats in 1964 was a foregone conclusion. He was chosen by acclamation in Atlantic City as his birthday present. He had dubbed his domestic program the Great Society, a sweeping set of New Dealish economic and welfare measures aimed at transforming the American way of life. Public support for LBJ's anti-poverty war was aroused by Michael Harrington's The Other America, which revealed that an affluent America was 20% of the population, but over 40% of the black population suffered in poverty. Thanks to Eisenhower, I'm sorry, Eisenhower, uh, to Johnson, the Democrats stood four square on their most liberal platform since Truman's Fair Deal days. The Republicans, meeting in San Francisco's Cow Palace, nominated Senator Barry Goldwater of Arizona, a champion of conservatism. The American stage was thus set for an historic clash of political principles. Goldwater's forces had galloped out of the Southwest to ride roughshod over the moderate Republican Eastern establishment, insisting that the GOP offer a choice not an echo. Goldwater attacked the federal income tax, the social security system, the Tennessee Valley Authority, civil rights legislation, the nuclear test ban, and of course, the Great Society. His fiercely dedicated followers proclaimed, in your heart you know he's right, which promoted the democratic response, in your guts you know he's nuts. Goldwater warmed right-wing hearts when he announced that extremism in the defense of liberty is no vice, and moderation in the pursuit of justice is no virtue. Goldwater radiated sincerity and charm, but his aggressive rightism repelled millions of his own fellow Republicans. The Arizonan also habitually shot from the lip notably when he urged that American field commanders be given discretionary authority to use tactical nuclear weapons. Democrats gleefully exploited the image of Goldwater as a trigger-happy cowboy who would bury us in the debris of World War III. This terrifying prospect loomed larger in the closing weeks of the campaign, when Russia's leader Khrushchev was sacked and Red China exploded its first nuclear bomb. In such a jittery atmosphere, voters shied away from the six-gun style of the Republican candidate. Johnson cultivated the image of a resolute statesman by seizing upon the Tonkin Gulf episode early in August 1964. Unbeknownst to the American public or Congress, U.S. Navy ships had been cooperating with South Vietnamese boat ships in provocative raids along the coast of North Vietnam. Two of these American destroyers were allegedly fired upon by the North Vietnamese on August the 2nd and August the 4th, although exactly what happened remains unclear. Johnson later reportedly quipped, For all I know, the Navy was shooting at whales out there. Johnson promptly called the attack unprovoked and moved swiftly to make political hay out of this episode. He ordered a limited retaliatory air raid against North Vietnamese bases, proudly proclaiming that he sought no wider war, thus implying that the trigger-happy Goldwater did. Johnson also used the incident to spur congressional passage of the all-purpose Tonkin Gulf Resolution. With only two dissenting votes in both houses, the lawmakers virtually abdicated their war-declaring powers and handed the president a blank check to use further force in Southeast Asia. 
the towering Texan rode to a spectacular victory in November 1964. The voters were herded into Johnson's column by fondness for the Kennedy legacy, faith in great society promises, and fear of Goldwater. A stampede of 43 million Johnson voters trampled the Republican ticket of 27 million. Goldwater carried only his native Arizona and five other states, all of them significantly, in racially restless Dixieland. This cracking of the once solidly democratic South afforded the Republicans about the only faint light in an otherwise bleak political picture. Johnson's record-breaking 61% of the popular vote swept lopsided Democratic majorities into both houses of Congress. The inept Goldwater proved to be not so much a candidate as a catastrophe as some observers predicted, the grand old party was stumbling down the road to the Federalist Whig Cemetery. Yet 16 years later, Ronald Reagan would sail to victory on a Republican platform quite similar to Goldwater's. Johnson's victory temporarily smashed the conservative coalition of Southern Democrats and Northern Republicans. A wide-open legislative road stretched before the Great Society programs, as the President skillfully ring-mastered his two-to-one Democratic majorities. Congress poured out a flood of legislation, comparable only to the output of the New Dealers in the Hundred Days Congress of 1933. Fiscal orthodoxy flew out the window, and planned deficits came in the door. As Johnson at last delivered on long delayed democratic promises of social reform. The Office of Economic Opportunity, the front line of the Great Society's War on Poverty, had its appropriation doubled to nearly two billion dollars. Congress granted more than a billion to redevelop the gutted hills of Appalachia, and voted a slightly greater amount for aid to elementary and secondary education. Johnson neatly avoided the thorny question of separation of church and state by channeling educational aid to students, not schools, thus allowing funds to flow to hard-pressed parochial institutions. With a keen eye for the dramatic, LBJ signed the education bill and the humble one-room Texas schoolhouse that he had attended as a boy. He also delighted in knowing that all these Harvard-educated people that were working for him were working for a graduate of the Southwest Texas State Teachers College. Other landmark laws flowed from Johnson's hip pocket Congress. Medicare for the elderly became a reality in 1965, although it was a bitter pill for the American Medical Association to swallow. The system was welcomed by millions of older Americans who were being pushed into poverty by skyrocketing, by skyrocketing medical costs. The tireless Johnson also prodded the Congress into creating two new cabinet offices, the Department of Transportation and the Department of Housing and Urban Development. He named the first black cabinet mem member in the nation's history, noted economist uh, Robert Weaver to be a Secretary of Housing and Urban Development. Other noteworthy laws established a National Endowment for the Arts and Humanities, designed to lift the level of American cultural life. And still other laws sweepingly reformed long-criticized quota system for immigrants. Great society programs came in for harsh political attack in later years. Conservatives charged that poverty could not be papered over with greenbacks, and that the billions spent for social engineering had simply been flushed down the waste pipe. Yet the poverty rate declined measurably in the ensuing decade. Medicare made especially dramatic reductions in the incidence of poverty among America's elderly. Other anti-poverty programs, among them Project Head Start, notably improved the educational performance of underprivileged youth. Infant mortality rates also fell in minority communities as general health conditions improved. 
Lyndon Johnson was not fully victorious in the war against poverty, and he doubtless fought some costly and futile campaigns. But he did win several noteworthy battles. In Johnson's native South, the walls of segregation were crumbling, but not fast enough for long-suffering blacks. The Civil Rights Act of 1964 gave the federal government more muscle to enforce school desegregation orders and to prohibit racial discrimination in all kinds of public accommodations and employment. But the problem of voting rights remained. In Mississippi, which had the largest black minority of any state, only about 5% of eligible blacks were registered to vote. The lopsided pattern was similar throughout the South. Ballot-denying devices like the poll tax, literacy tests, and barefaced intimidation still barred black people from the political process. Mississippi law required the names of prospective black residents to be published for two weeks in local newspapers a device that virtually guaranteed economic reprisals, or worse. Beginning in 1964, opening up the polling booths became the chief goal of the black movement in the South. The 24th Amendment, ratified in January 1964, abolished the poll tax in federal elections. Blacks joined hands with white civil rights workers, many of them student volunteers from the North in a massive voter registration drive in Mississippi during the Freedom Summer of 1964. Singing, We Shall Overcome, they zealously set out to soothe generations of white anxieties and black fears. But events soon blighted bright hopes. In late June 1964, one black and two white civil rights workers disappeared in Mississippi. Their badly beaten bodies were later found buried beneath an earthen dam. FBI investigators eventually arrested 21 white Mississippians in connection with the killings, including the local sheriff. But white juries refused to convict whites for these murders. In August, an integrated Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party delegation was denied its seat at the National Democratic Convention. Only a handful of black Mississippians had succeeded in registering to vote. Early in 1965, Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. resumed the voter registration campaign in Selma, Alabama, where blacks made up 50% of the population, but only 1% of the voters. State troopers with tear gas and whips assaulted King's demonstrators as they marched peacefully to the state capitol at Montgomery. A Boston Unitarian minister was killed, and a few days later a white Detroit woman was shotgunned to death by Klansmen on the highway near Selma. As the nation recoiled in horror before these violent scenes, President Johnson, speaking in soft southern accents, delivered a memorable address on television. What happened in Selma, he insisted, concerned all Americans, who must overcome the crippling legacy of bigotry and injustice. Then, in a stirring adaption of the anthem of the Civil Rights Movement, the President concluded, and we shall overcome. Following words with deeds, Johnson speedily shepherded through Congress the landmark Voting Rights Act of 1965 signed into law on August the 6th. It outlawed literacy tests and sent federal voter registrars into several southern states. The passage of the Voting Rights Act exactly 100 years after the conclusion of the Civil War climaxed a century of awful abuse and robust resurgence for our African Americans in the South. Give us the vote, said Martin Luther King Jr., and the South will never be the same. And he was right. The act did not end discrimination and oppression overnight, but it placed an awesome lever for change within the hands of black voters. Black Southerners now had power and began to wield it without fear of reprisals. 
white Southerners began to court black votes and businesses as never before. In the following decade, for the first time since emancipation, black Americans began to migrate into the South. The Voting Rights Act of 1965 marked the end of an era in the troubled history of the black movement, the era of civil rights campaigns, focused on the South and led by peaceable moderates like Martin Luther King Jr. Just five days after President Johnson signed the new voting law, a bloody riot exploded in Watts, a black ghetto in Los Angeles. Enraged blacks burned and looted their own neighborhoods for nearly a week. When the smoke finally cleared, 31 blacks and three whites lay dead. More than a thousand persons had been injured, and hundreds of buildings stood charred and gutted. Increasingly, violent voices began to be heard in the black movement, and its leadership divided dangerously between advocates of peaceful and or militant tactics. Rising bitterness was highlighted by the career of Malcolm X, a brilliant black Muslim preacher who favored black separatism and condemned the blue-eyed white devils. In early 1965, he was cut down by black gunmen while speaking to a large crowd in New York City. The moderation of Martin Luther King Jr. came under heavy fire from younger black radicals in June 1966. Trinidad-born Stokely Carmichael vowed to resume a voter registration march through Mississippi after its originator, James Meredith, had been gunned down along a Mississippi highway. He was the same black man who had gained entrance to the University of Mississippi in 1962. Sharp disagreements almost immediately sprang forth, as Carmichael urged giving up peaceful demonstrations and pursuing black power. The phrase black power frightened many whites, and their fears deepened when Stokely Carmichael was quoted as saying that black power Quote, will smash everything Western civilization has created. Unquote. Level-headed advocates of black power intended the slogan to describe a broad front effort to exercise the political rights gained by the civil rights movement. But most people saw it for what it actually stood for. This was a direct threat against everything that America stood for. Riotous tactics angered white Americans, who now threatened to retaliate with their own backlash against arsonists and murderers. Inner city anarchy baffled many who had considered racial problems a purely southern question. But black concerns had moved out of the South and into the rest of the nation. In the North, the black power movement now focused less on civil rights and more on economic demands. Black unemployment, for example, was nearly double that for whites. These oppressive new problems seemed even less likely to be solved peaceably than the struggle for voting rights in the South. Violence at home eclipsed Johnson's legislative triumphs, while foreign flare-ups threatened his political life. Discontented Dominicans rose in revolt against their military government in April 1965. Johnson speedily announced that the Dominican Republic was the target of a Castro-like coup by communist conspirators, and he dispatched American troops, some 25,000, to protect American lives and restore order. But the evidence of a communist takeover was uh, not a clear-cut case. Johnson was widely condemned at home and in Latin America for his temporary 
reversion to the officially abandoned gunboat diplomacy. Critics charged that the two-fisted Texan was far too eager to back right-wing regimes with bayonets. At about the same time, Johnson was floundering deeper in the monsoon mud of Vietnam. Viet Cong guerrillas attacked an American air base in February 1965. The president immediately ordered retaliatory bombing raids against military installations in North Vietnam, and for the first time ordering U.S. troops on the land. By the middle of March 1965, the Americans had Operation Rolling Thunder in full swing. Regular full-scale bombing attacks against North Vietnam. Before 1965 ended, some 184,000 American troops were involved, most of them slogging through the jungles and rice paddies of South Vietnam, searching for guerrillas clad in black pajamas. When Barry Goldwater was asked what he would be doing differently in Vietnam if he were president, he replied that he would be doing the same thing, only catching hell for it. Many Americans complained that they had voted for Johnson, but had gotten Goldwater. Johnson had now taken the first fateful steps down a slippery path. He and his advisers believed that a fine-tuned step-by-step escalation of American force would drive the enemy in defeat, with a minimum loss of life on both sides. But the president reckoned without due knowledge of the toughness, resiliency, and dedication of the local Viet Cong and their North Vietnamese allies. Aerial bombardment actually strengthened the communists' will to resist. The enemy matched every increase in American firepower with more men and more willingness in the art of guerrilla warfare. The South Vietnamese themselves were meanwhile becoming spectators in their own war, as the fighting became increasingly Americanized. Corrupt and collapsible governments succeeded each other in Saigon with bewildering rapidity. Yet American officials continued to dock of defending a faithful democratic ally. Washington spokespersons also defended America's action as a test of Uncle Sam's commitment and of the reliability of his numerous treaty pledges to resist communist encroachment. If the United States were to cut and run from Vietnam claimed pro-war hawks, other nations would doubt America's word, crumble under communist pressure, and drive America's first line of defense back to Hawaii, or even to the coast of California. Persuaded by such panicky thinking, Johnson steadily raised the military stakes in Vietnam. By 1968, he had poured more than half a million troops into Southeast Asia, and the annual bill for the war was exceeding $30 billion. At the end, was nowhere in sight. America could not defeat the enemy in Vietnam, but it seemed to be defeating itself. World opinion grew increasingly hostile. The blasting of an underdeveloped country by a mighty superpower struck many critics as obscene. Several nations expelled American Peace Corps volunteers. Disgusted European allies complained that they were being neglected militarily and punished economically as America exported war-bred inflation to its trading partners. Haughty Charles de Gaulle, ever suspicious of American reliability, ordered NATO off French soil in 1966. Overcommitment in Southeast Asia also tied America's hands elsewhere. Capitalizing on American distractions in the Orient, the Soviet Union expanded its influence in the Mediterranean area, especially in Egypt. Tiny Israel humiliated the Russian-backed Egyptians in a devastating six-day war in June 1967, but the Middle East remained a packed powder keg that the war-plagued United States could not defuse. The United States proved equally helpless when the North Koreans seized a U.S. intelligence ship, the Pueblo, in January 1968, evidently in international waters. 
they imprisoned the crew of some eighty men for eleven months. This humiliating episode angered red-blooded Americans, but it provoked no military response at a time when one Asiatic war was more than enough. Domestic discontent also festered as the Vietnamese entanglement dragged on. Anti-war demonstrations had begun on a small scale with campus teach-ins in 1965, and gradually these protests mounted to a tidal wave. As the long arm of the military draft dragged more and more young men off to the Asian slaughterhouse, resistance stiffened. Thousands of draft registrants fled to Canada. Others publicly burned their draft cards. Hundreds of thousands of marchers filled the streets of New York, San Francisco, and other cities, chanting, Hell no, we won't go. Countless citizens felt the pinch of war-spawned inflation. Many Americans also felt pangs of conscience at the spectacle of their countrymen burning peasant hunts and blistering civilians with ghastly napalm. Opposition in Congress to the Vietnam involvement centered in the influential Senate Committee on Foreign Relations, headed by a former Rhodes Scholar, scholar Senator Fulbright of Arkansas. A constant thorn in the side of the President, he staged a series of widely viewed televised hearings in 1966, during which prominent uh, personages aired their views, largely anti-war. Gradually, the public came to feel that it had been lied to about the causes and winnability of the war. A yawning credibility gap opened between the government and the people. New flocks of anti-war doves were hatching daily. Even within the administration, doubts were deepening about the wisdom of the war in Vietnam. When Defense Secretary McNamara expressed increasing discomfiture at the course of events, he was quietly eased out of the cabinet. President Johnson did announce bombing halts in early 1966, supposedly to lure the enemy to the peace table, but Washington did not pursue its peace initiatives with much energy, and the other side did not respond with encouragement. Both sides used the bombing pauses to funnel more troops into South Vietnam. By early 1968, the brutal and futile struggle had become the longest and most unpopular foreign war in the nation's history. The government had failed utterly to explain to the people what was supposed to be at stake in Vietnam. Many critics wondered if any objective could be worth the vast price in blood that America was paying. Casualties, killed and wounded, already exceeded a 100,000. More bombs had been dropped on Vietnam than on all enemy territory in World War II. Evidence mounted that America had been entrapped in an Asian civil war, fighting, almost highly, fighting against highly motivated rebels who were striving to overthrow an oppressive regime. Yet Johnson clung to his basic strategy of stepping up the pressure bit by bit. He stubbornly assured doubting Americans that he could see the light at the end of the tunnel. But to growing numbers of Americans, it seemed that Johnson was bent on saving Vietnam by destroying it. Hawkish illusions that the struggle was about to be won were shattered by a blistering communist offensive launched in late January 1968, during Tet, which was the Vietnamese New Year. Tet is the Vietnamese New Year. At a time when the Viet Cong were supposedly licking their wounds, they suddenly and simultaneously mounted savage attacks on 27 key South Vietnamese cities, including the capital, Saigon. Although eventually beaten off with heavy losses, they demonstrated anew that victory could not be gained by Johnson's strategy of gradual escalation. The Tet Offensive ended in a military defeat, 
but a political victory for the Viet Cong. With an increasingly insistent voice, the American public opinion demanded a speedy end to the war. Opposition grew so vehement that President Johnson could feel the foundations of government shaking under his feet. American military leaders responded to the Tet attacks with a request for 200,000 more troops, the largest single increase yet. This would have swollen American troop strength in Vietnam to about three-quarters of a million. The size of the request staggered many policymakers. Former Secretary of State Dean Acheson reportedly advised the President that the Joint Chiefs of Staff don't know what they're talking about. Johnson himself now began to doubt seriously the wisdom of continuing on his raise-the-stakes course. The President, meanwhile, was being sharply challenged from within his own party. Eugene McCarthy, a little-known Democratic senator from Minnesota, had emerged as a contender for the 1968 Democratic presidential nomination. The soft-spoken McCarthy, a sometime poet and devout Catholic, gathered a small army of anti-war college students as campaign workers. Going clean for Gene was part of their campaign slogan. With clean faces and shortened locks, these idealistic recruits of the Children's Crusade invaded the key presidential primary state of New Hampshire to ring doorbells. On March the 12th of 1968, their efforts gave McCarthy an incredible 42% of the Democratic vote. President Johnson was on the same ballot, but only as a write-in candidate. Four days later, Senator Robert F. Kennedy of New York, the murdered president's younger brother, and by now himself a dove on Vietnam, threw his hat into the ring. The charismatic Kennedy, heir to his fallen brother's mantle of leadership, stirred a passionate response amongst uh, workers, blacks, Hispanics, and young people. These startling events abroad and at home were not lost on LBJ. The country might explode in greater violence if he met the request of the generals for more troops. His own party was dangerously divided on the war issue. He might not even be able to win renomination after his relatively poor showing in New Hampshire. Yet he remained committed to victory in Vietnam. How could he salvage this situation? Johnson's answer came in a bombshell address on March the 31st, 1968. He announced on nationwide television that he would finally apply the brakes to the escalating war. He would freeze American troop levels and gradually shift more responsibility to the South Vietnamese themselves. Aerial bombardment of the enemy would be drastically scaled down. Then, in a dramatic plea to unify a dangerously divided nation, Johnson startled his vast audience by firmly declaring that he would not be a candidate for the presidency in 1968. Johnson's abdication had the effect of preserving the military status quo. He had held the hawks in check while offering himself as a sacrifice to the militant doves. The United States could thus maintain the maximum acceptable level of military activity in Vietnam with one hand, while trying to negotiate a settlement with the other. North Vietnam responded somewhat encouragingly three days later, when it expressed a willingness to talk about peace. After a month of haggling over the site, the adversaries agreed to meet in Paris. But progress was glacially slow as prolonged bickering developed over the very shape of the conference table. It later was revealed that Richard Nixon, fearing that a quick end to the war would hurt Republican chances in the upcoming presidential election, had secretly communicated with the South Vietnamese, urging them to stall discussion until after the election. 
But the South Vietnamese had their own reasons for delay, and Nixon's intervention, while ethically questionable, probably had really, really very little effect on the talks. Summer in 1968 was one of the hottest political seasons in the nation's history. Johnson's heir apparent for the Democratic nomination was his liberal vice president, Hubert Humphrey, a former pharmacist, college teacher, mayor, and senator. Loyally supporting LBJ's Vietnam policies through thick and thin, he received the support of the party apparatus, dominated as it was by the White House. Senators McCarthy and Kennedy, meanwhile, dueled in several state primaries, with Kennedy's bandwagon gathering ever-increasing speed. But on June the 5th, 1968, the night of an exciting victory in the California primary, Kennedy was shot to death by a young Arab immigrant resentful of the candidate's pro-Israeli views. Surrounded by bitterness and frustration, the Democrats met in Chicago in late August 1968. Angry anti-war zealots, deprived by an assassin's bullet of their leading candidate, streamed menacingly into Chicago. Mayor Daley responded by arranging for barbed wire barricades around the convention hall, as well as thousands of police and the National Guard Many demonstrators baited the officers in blue, calling them pigs. Other militants shouted obscenities and hurled bags and cans of human filth at the police lines. As people the world over watched on television, the exasperated peace officers broke into a police riot, clubbing and manhandling innocent and guilty alike. Tear gas hung heavy over the city, and even drifted up to Candidate Humphrey's hotel suite. Hundreds of people were arrested and scores hospitalized, but no one was killed, except, as Senex said, the Democratic Party and its candidate. Humphrey steamrolled to the nomination on the first ballot. The dovish McCarthyites failed even to secure an anti-war platform plank. Instead, the Humphrey forces, echoing the president, rammed through their own declaration that armed force would be relentlessly applied until the enemy showed more willingness to negotiate. Scenting victory as the Democrats divided, the Republicans had jubilantly convened in Miami, Florida, early in August 1968. Richard M. Nixon, the former vice president, whom John F. Kennedy had narrowly defeated eight years earlier, arose from his political grave to win the nomination. Nixon will, for the first time since 1840, win a presidential election after having previously been defeated. But Nixon had doggedly entered and won several Republican nominations and primaries. Nixon appealed to white Southern voters and to the law and order element when he tapped his vice presidential running mate, Maryland's Governor Spiro T. Agnew. Noted for his tough stands against blacks and dissidents, the Republican platform called for victory in Vietnam and a strong anti-crime policy. A spoiler third-party ticket, the American Independent Party, added to the confusion of the campaign. It was headed by George Wallace, former governor of Alabama. In 1963, he had stood in the doorway to prevent two black students from entering the University of Alabama. Speaking behind a bulletproof screen, he called for prodding the blacks into their place with bayonets, if necessary. He and his running mate, former Air Force General Curtis LeMay, 
also proposed smashing the North Vietnamese to smithereens by bombing them back to the Stone Age. Vietnam proved a less crucial issue than expected. Between the positions of the Republicans and the Democrats, there was little to choose. Both candidates were committed to keeping on with the war until the enemy would settle for an honorable peace, which seemed to be an American victory. The millions of doves had no place to roost, and many refused to vote at all. Humphrey, scorched by the LBJ brand, went down to defeat as a loyal prisoner of his chief's policies, despite Johnson's last-minute effort to bail him out by announcing a total bombing halt. Nixon, who had lost a cliffhanger to Kennedy in 1960, won another in 1968. He had 31,700 and 85,480 votes, compared to 31,275,166 for Humphrey. So, barely over a half a million votes difference. Not since Woodrow Wilson in 1912 had the victor received so small a percentage. Nixon was also the first president-elect since 1848, not to bring in on his coattails at least one House of Congress for his party in an initial presidential election. He carried not a single major city, thus attesting to the continuing urban strength of the Democrats, who also won about 95% of the black vote. Nixon had received no clear mandate to do anything. He was a minority president who owed his election to divisions over the war and protest against the unfair draft, crime, and rioting. Talented but tragically struck, Lyndon Johnson returned to his Texas ranch in January of 1969 and died there four years later. His party was defeated and his Me Too Hubert Humphrey was repudiated. His popularity remained low in the opinion polls, although it had risen somewhat after his great renunciation, ironically one of his most popular acts. Yet Johnson's legislative leadership for a time had been remarkable. No president since Lincoln had worked harder or done more for civil rights. None had shown more compassion for the poor, the ill-educated, and the black. Johnson seemed to suffer from a kind of inferiority complex about his own arid cultural background, and he strove furiously to prove that he could be a great people's president in the image of his idol Franklin Roosevelt. His legislative achievements in his first three years in office indeed invited comparison with those of the New Deal. But by 1966, Johnson was already sinking into the Vietnam quicksands. The Republicans had made gains in Congress, and a white backlash had begun to form against the black movement. Great society programs began to wither on the vine as soaring war costs sucked tax dollars into the military machine. Johnson had promised both guns and butter, but could not keep either promise. Ever-creeping inflation blighted the prospects of prosperity, and the war on poverty met resistance that was as stubborn as the Viet Cong, and eventually went down to defeat. Great want persisted alongside great wealth. Johnson had crucified himself on the cross of Vietnam. The Asian quagmire engulfed his noblest intentions. Committed to some degree by his two predecessors, he had chosen to defend the American foothold and enlarge the conflict, rather than be run out. He was evidently persuaded by his brightest advisers, both civilian and military, that a cheap victory was possible. It would be achieved by massive aerial bombing and large, though limited, troop commitments. His decision not to escalate the fighting further offended the hawks and his refusal to back off altogether antagonized the doves. 
Like the Calvinists of colonial days, luckless Johnson was damned if he did, and damned if he did not. The struggles of the 1960s against racism, poverty, and the war in Vietnam had momentous cultural consequences. The decade came to be seen as a watershed dividing two distinct eras in terms of values, morals, and behavior. Launched in youthful idealism, many of the reform movements of the 60s sputtered out in violence and cynicism. Students for a Democratic Society, once at the forefront of the anti-poverty and anti-war programs, had, by decade's end, spawned an underground terrorist group called the Weathermen. Peaceful civil rights demonstrators had given way to block-busting urban riots. What started as apparently innocent experimentation with drugs like marijuana and LSD had fried many youthful brains and spawned an underworld of drug lords and addicted users. Everywhere in 60s America, a newly negative attitude towards all kinds of authority took hold. Disillusioned by the discovery that American society was not free of racism, sexism, imperialism, and oppression, many young people lost their traditional moral rudders. Neither families nor churches nor schools seemed to be able to define values and shape behavior with a certainty of shared purpose that many people believed had once existed. The upheaval even churned the tradition-bound Roman Catholic Church. Among the world's oldest and most conservative institutions, clerics abandoned their Roman collars and Latin lingo. Folk songs replaced Gregorian chants, and meatless Fridays became ancient history. No matter what the topic, conventional wisdom and inherited ideas came under fire. Trust no one over thirty was a popular sneer of rebellious youth. Skepticism about authority had deep historical roots in American culture, and it had even bloomed in the supposedly complacent and conformist 1950s. Beat poets like Allen Ginsberg and iconoclastic novelists like Jack uh, Kerouac had voiced dark disillusion with the materialistic beliefs of establishment culture in the Eisenhower era. In movies like Rebel Without a Cause, which came out in 1955, the attractive young actor James Dean expressed the restless frustration of many young people. The dissatisfaction of the young reached crisis proportions in the tumultuous 1960s. One of the first organized protests against established authority broke out at the University of California in Berkeley in 1964, and the so-called free speech movement. One of its leaders, condemning the impersonal bureaucratization of higher education, earned students to put your bodies against the machine and don't stop until we're free. Prompted by seething resentment against the war in Vietnam, many sons and daughters of the middle class turned to mind-bending drugs, tuned in to acid rock, and dropped out of straight society. Others did their own thing in communes or alternative institutions. Patriotism became a dirty word. Beflowered women in trousers and long-haired men with earrings heralded the rise of a self-conscious counterculture, vehemently opposed to traditional American ways. Sexual attitudes also seemed drastically altered as women's roles rapidly changed and as increasing numbers of women and men engaged in premarital intimacies. Legal sanctions against obscenity and pornography withered away, and profanity and nudity became almost obligatory on stage and screen. Old taboos against homosexuality crumbled as gay people emerged and loudly demanded sexual tolerance. Yet the sexual revolution would soon be slowed by widening worries about sexually communicated diseases like genital herpes and AIDS. 
straight-laced guardians of responsibility denounced the self-indulgent romanticism of the flower children as the beginning of the end of modern civilization. Sympathetic observers hailed the greening of America, the replacement of materialism and imperialism by a new consciousness of human values. But the upheavals of the 60s could be largely attributed to three Ps. The youthful population bulge, protest against racism, and the Vietnam War. As the decade flowered into the 1970s, the flower children grew older and had children of their own. The civil rights movement fell silent. The war ended, and economic stagnation blighted the bloom of prosperity. Young people in the 70s seemed more concerned with finding a job in the system than with tearing the system down. The counterculture appeared in retrospect to be not the road to the future, but an historically blind alley. But if it had not managed fully to replace older valley values, it had weakened their grip. And with that, we will end with the 1960s. Thank you.